Our time today has shaped what I'm going to say now. <laughs> and I'm so happy for that. I am so deeply grateful to have experienced the layers of wisdom that you carry in your individual dispositions of what you are bringing to the world, but in this collective intention to witness each other's agreement to be women at a time in the age when the greatest opportunity for our planet is the wisdom itself that's here, not the knowledge alone. And I, 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 just in the feeling and interaction, I want to speak about this Sophia consciousness. That is the bearer of the creator. Some years ago in working with um, one of my mentors by the name of Gyar Kulovin, he was a phenomenologist, an anthroposophist, and he had introduced the idea of meditative observation, that one of the capacities of attention is that it can move from this level of normal engagement to a meditative level that can peel away the obstructions that are inherited and move from the inheritance to this creative power that is in attentiveness. And I think in some ways when we share space with women whose attention had been given to their particular path of development and particularly where the world has gone, in relationship to this global culture of uh, particularly oppression of this virtue. Attention has done something. It, is, it has moved beyond the culture itself. And so one of the meditative lines that we worked with was, I nurture my creator. I nurture my creator and take it into contemplation. What does it mean to nurture that which will create you? In this gesture that is emerging in our collective world reality in women is that they were nurturing and have been nurturing the creator of this new age. And I often remind my young friends, the world is not man-made, as much as we would want to think it is. The conceptual world is finished because we mostly agree that it is. But the creative world is a view. And so we have the world and we have world views. And often in mentorships, before you start anything in the world, make sure your worldview is true. Can you see what is creatively potential and engaging for you to do. So we just don't go and buy things because they're finished. We don't just go and take a work because that's a given. Why I'm bringing this into, into this conversation is that the money that we are using is not value neutral. One thing that we have learned in economy is that 
money is just a medium of exchange. And that you can shape it. Well, that's true if we are not only conscious, but super conscious of our own motives, as you said, our relationship to money. But how early is our relationship to money formed? I was sharing earlier, I was with some friends and a two-year-old child heard the ice cream truck coming <laughs> down the block. And most of us who are around children who know ice cream and kids, they would just want the ice cream. And we will have to, adults will have to figure out how we get it for them. <laughs> This child came to me and asked for a dollar. Let me see. The two-year-old came to me and asked for a dollar to buy ice cream. And I thought, I was shocked. I, it was the most shocking thing that you're not supposed to buy anything at two years old. You know? You're just supposed to want stuff. <laughs> and let us feel whether it's right time to get it for you. But at two years old, he had already begun to negotiate the power that should be reserved for later stages of life. Yes, one can say it's mimicking, and that is true. But that is how we are imprinted with values that money generates. And at two years old, he had no protection from the power to purchase something. And it overrides the fundamental principle of taste <laughs> that a child carries, the need to be unreasonable about wanting something, because this is the freedom that children should have to explore what is it that the perception carries, that you help, we help you learn how far to go with your wants. But to want a dollar for me, in which if he can't understand the significance of not having a dollar at two years old, by five, seven, ten, what can he think of doing to get a dollar? That was my fear. If we keep telling him no, his will will increase that he's going to get it by any means necessary. Because the purchasing power is overriding the fundamental predisposition to ask a parent for something to eat. And so this, when I say nurture, I nurture my creator. I, we have to put the creator back into the human perception and cognitions so that when we are sharing spaces, it starts so early how we think and relate to money. And why I said it's not value neutral that the type of currency that we use to engage our life influences our behavior in particular ways. One, because the dollar has to be scarce in order to be valuable. So this is a monetary structure. It doesn't matter how much we have. The design of the dollar and the euro and most national currencies is that they have to be scarce in order to create the economy that they're to serve. And scarcity is fundamentally imprinted into everyone's consciousness in the use of these currencies. We then have to supplement it, and most of us have been sharing the many ways of how we've had to supplement our own consciousness to override the behavioral characteristics in our currencies by doing something more with consciousness. 
by observing our behaviors and attitudes and choices and influencing them in certain ways to get out of the predictable pattern that money generates when we use it in the unconscious attitudes. And in working with currency design principles, we learned that some currencies are feminine and some are masculine in their design based on the articulating idea of what the currency is intended to do. And so you cannot create a currency if we don't create the archetypal image that it's to get people's behavior to become group-oriented in a way in which they produce the economy that the creators of the currency design it to do. And so one must ask this fundamental question in our democracy. Can this currency that we use, that is issued by private interests, support collective destiny processes in a democratic conscious factor? Meaning, do, does our role in society truly honored if what we need to create society is scarce? The, the role of women in this is very critical. It's hard to consider men creating a feminine currency. The, the next step in our futures of money have to consider what must be nurtured to protect not just people, planet as well because there are currencies that actually prohibit the misuse of these forces of nature. In ancient times, I learned from, from our, uh, our elders in, in, in South Africa that the gold mine and the diamond mines and all the mineral wealth belonged to women. Why? Because energetically, only women's energy could go into the earth to get it that when men went into the diamond mines, they came out mentally ill because the magnetic forces of the earth itself did not complement the psyche of men. And so wealth and women had a phenomenological and a religious and spiritual lawfulness to it that was carried and was in a certain way overthrown by the male priesthood, who just didn't just want power of divination, they wanted power of mineralization. They wanted the mineral wealth as well to articulate and create these systems. So we, we look at places in the world where mineral wealth is being created and we see the, the impact of, on men. Whether the blood diamonds in, in Congo and all over, whatever is happening when people are trying to disrupt this earth factor and not understanding the consequence, not only economy, but on their own psychology. Where, where, where we are in the shift, and I said, and I appreciate the, 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 the movements in the world that is saying there must be some consideration for basic income. And I have always said, give it to the women first. If there's a basic income whereby the lawfulness of society's wealth could be placed in the nurturing gesture of women, where the creativity that meets this psychic field that women hold for the world will allow a change from profession to prophetism, to move to the prophetic stage, to see futures really for what they can be. Yes. 
it's already it's already in a way what these elder women as I shared this morning was trying to remind me and share with me and teach me that we see something and we hope to invest it in you to talk about it share it and nurture it our one of one who had a meeting with some with some friends and um, some business people came to meet with us and they were all young men some of the two of them had their children uh, infant children uh, children with them child with them and uh, the comment was made well there are no women in the room and I said yes but there's a lot of feminine in the room and I said if you had known these men five years ago you probably wouldn't be sitting here because they were so violent that they would not even allow you to come into this place. But this is the archetype of the Madonna and child. There's a man holding his child. He would have been in jail, in prison somewhere, but he had to be nurtured back to allow his own feminine power to hold his child to allow the mother to have some time <laughs> to be herself. Part of the work was not, it wasn't just the gender in the way of biolo biology, it was the gender in psychology. Can people reintegrate into themselves back the nurturing power to put away violence and manipulation into caring and collaboration? And I feel when we invite the, the, the exploration of money and moving it from the, 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 the level where we're talking about the um, functional, uh, creative ways in which we do business and such and investments, it's really important that we understand the monetary level the systemic level. At the systemic level, the design is everything that is printed as money goes back to its source. Meaning that they could raise interest rates and money go back to the bank. This imbalance of interests and scarcity have a profound effect on the psyche. And you, you, have you heard about the 11th round? You know that, that idea that if the bank gives you $10, they tell you to bring back 11. Mm. And if the 11th one is never printed, so in order for people to bring back interest, someone has to fail. Someone has to be poor. It's a design that poverty is a design principle in monetary systems. And yes, if people can't compete, they will be poor. And if their virtue is that they will not compete because their ancestral memory doesn't allow that, then they have to live within a marginalization that looks like permanent poverty. When their wealth is the fact that they're trying to nurture a future that no one is invested in. So part of coming back, I say, part of coming back to the, to the understanding of indigenousity is that in every human being is the sensitivity forces to be able to say, I am here, and from here I could see futures, and I can find the people with whom those futures belong and co-create with them, 
by making the agreements, even in the absence of money, to begin to show that future that then money can come with people who trust that gesture of vision. And so these, we we'll say, visioning processes are happening all over the world in indigenous communities everywhere. And yes, microfinancing is helping some of them. But the complexity of American society, Western society as a whole, is that microfinancing is not enough. Because it's not the individual that one must help, one must help the group. Meaning it's the group of women whose work matters. The collective consciousness and wisdom of women is what the next phase of investment should be considering because it has something in it, the collective impulse, that has benefited from the enforced scarcity that the patriarchal world economy has placed in women. And it may look like having nothing or less, but this is what the mystery of this idea, I nurture my creator, is. The reversing of the will, when there's nothing, there is something. Spirit does not allow people not to have. There is no such principle in spiritual understanding. And so I want to encourage this gesture of nurturing the collective examination of what it means to be a society of wisdom keepers that is not in the world to create a market for what you know. It's not a market we're looking for for what you carry. And someone said it is the acknowledgement, the sacred acknowledgement that it's really time, really time to transition this economy to this abundance. One asks, you know, people ask, well, it, what, what, what will happen to, to men? We'll become more men. We'll become more ourselves. You don't stop being yourself. But the initiation of our culture, the initiation of men to the next level of this Trust is to move money out of the hands of men. Or the power, the authority is still let there be. Not the currency itself, but the power to say let there be with such an exclusive authority. And I was saying, rather than competing for it, demonstrate collectively the right to say, let there be a society that is just and equitable and true to the wisdom that is inherent in human life. And I thank you for doing that work and bringing it into this collective space together today. Thank you so very much. <laughs>